The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Let's pray. I want to do activations today. Uh, I want to do what Jennifer and I dreamed of when we first got married, saying if we could only get it videoed, audio does not do some of the things that we teach justice. They need to see it like we are. We're visual. I like a chalkboard or diagrams, whatever, something to show me what it's like. So we're going to do the whole service. I'm going to call people up and... Uh, that ought to scare a few people. I, I could feel the atmosphere change when I said that. <laughs> I'm going to call a few people up. Um, and we're, we're going to do that. Uh, <clears throat> remember when we first got married, we were looking for a church. Oh, we were traveling church to church. We're going, oh, if we could just find a church that had, what was it then? VHS. You know, if we could just find somebody, I would love to do all of the activations so that they could see visually what it looks like. And so... Um, I want to title this message, <clears throat> well, I'm a, what am I going to title this message? How to receive and walk in the Spirit daily, all right? You know, you're supposed to live your Christian life daily, right? Does everybody know that? Everybody, <laughs> I didn't know. Okay, so... Um, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, if we titled this message, and if you're a note taker, I would write this down, receiving, receiving and walking in the Spirit. Receiving in the Spirit. Now remember in Corinthians, I believe it's uh, uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 14, it says, the natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit. They're foolishness. So we're going to do a lot of foolishness today. But don't be like some of those cerebral Christians that only have a head knowledge of the Bible and not spiritual intimacy connection. You know, they have a tendency to call everything New Age. If you don't understand it, call it New Age. But I'll tell you what, you're better off saying, I don't know, because wisdom searches out the matter. You don't call the Holy Spirit the devil, that's not a smart move. Better to say, I don't know. I know many people that were not spirit-filled that simply said, I don't know if that's, if that's for real or not. And those are the ones that got spirit-filled. The ones that said, I am adamantly against that. That's not scriptural. That's a, you know, they never did. So it's really the attitude of the heart is wisdom searches out a matter. Say, Lord, if that's you, teach me. Bring me into that place of supernatural experience. And uh, so receiving and walking in the Spirit, you know, we emphasize discernment, discerning uh, the, the, the Spirit within. And, and not so much uh, gifts of discernment can be for other people, yes, but really uh, a, a walk in the Spirit is, is letting the Word of God discern you. And you, you discern in the day-to-day, moment-by-moment relationship, you make choices. Jason did a beautiful teaching on that. Uh, it requires discernment to make good choices. And discernment requires you to walk in a reverence for God. So this is the way I want to begin. We all know the scripture in uh, Colossians 3.23. In everything that you do, this is what we're going to activate today. In everything you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not as so men can see what you're doing. Not as men pleasers. You follow me? So that means when you're doing... The day-to-day routine in school, in the home, in the neighborhood, wherever you're at, the day-to-day routine is that my motivation is to honor God. And that's regardless of crazy people that are in your life. (laughs) You have to learn to navigate circumstances and people to where in everything you do, you do it as unto the Lord. All right? You acknowledge people, obviously. 
But that acknowledgement needs to come from, I'm going to learn how to respond instead of react. And we're going to get into the different activations that, uh, quite frankly, um, uh, Jennifer never saw a taught in all the years. She was a Christian before we got married. So I said, if we only had video, we could do this. So we're going to teach you how to walk in daily discernment. Discernment means that which is flesh, that which is spirit, making a distinction. And what are you supposed to choose? Spirit over flesh, right? Okay, but you have to make a distinction. If you don't know the difference, you're in trouble. So you're going to have to learn to discern the difference. This is good, this is evil. And the Word of God will, you start by getting into the Word of God as a baby Christian so that the Word discerns you. You should be reading the Word and go, oh, I didn't do that. Okay, first it goes, oh. And then, then you surrender to that Word of God and you go, ah. And that ah is the satisfaction that only comes from God. Only. And that's when the Word is written on the tablet of the heart. All right, so you ready? All right, we're going to start with, with willpower. Now, here's the scripture we use in a, in a lot of our modules, and it's very important uh, that we use the message translation because the message translation breaks it down into little baby steps so that we can walk this out. And um, there's people that are... Uh, that really need our online school is what they really need because it puts it in a sequential order. But today, you're in luck. If you haven't been on the online school, I'm going to do it in sequential order so that you can apply these things, and make some good notes. And I'm going to do it visually. How many know that 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5 says, the weapons of our warfare, this is the way you learned it if you memorized it, or the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly. So we have weapons that are not carnal, not fleshly. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly. And these weapons of our warfare um, tear down philosophies and arguments and any exalted opinion that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now we're talking the knowledge of God. I'm talking the Word of God made real. There's... There's nothing more important than recognizing that we have these God tools. And the message takes that same verse of Scripture, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. That's the way I learned it, King James, New King James. All right, But listen to this in the message. This will take us and train us or disciple us into a walk. It says... We use our powerful God tools. And that really caught on for us. We like that term. God tools. Where are these God tools? Well, they're in you. <laughs> Uh-oh. Then you're, you're without excuse if you don't learn how to use them. Right? Jennifer, one time, she laid out, uh, well, not one time, she does this on a regular basis, in the bathroom, she lays down on the counter all of her tools. And they are the most amazing things I've ever seen. I have no idea how they work. But she's got all these girl tools. And so men, don't ever laugh at your wife if she doesn't know what a crescent wrench is from a lug wrench, all right? Because if you saw their tools, you wouldn't know what they were either. Do you ever see an, eye, an eyelash curler? Whoa. If, if, you didn't, if you were just a guy, you look at that thing and go, wow, what in the world does this do? Does it peel a potato? I don't know. What, what does it do? All right. All right. But those are people tools. We need God tools. And this is what 2 Corinthians chapter 10 in the message translation says. We use our powerful, that means they're full of energy and power to make change. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies. And right now, the warped philosophies that we want to see smashed primarily is that progressive Christianity stuff that's rampant right now, where they chop out uh, in the name of being progressive. Isn't that interesting, the words they use? Progressive, they end up cutting parts of the Bible out that are inconvenient. So you just believe the parts you like. <laughs> um, smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers that have been erected against the truth. You can have mental strongholds that are arguments in, 
that you've picked up from culture that argue against what the Word says. Well, those things need to be brought down. These are what God tools do. They smash warped philosophies. They tear down barriers erected against the truth. Fitting, and I love this in the message translation because it shows you the areas that we teach. It says, fitting every loose thought, emotion, and impulse. That's mind, will, and emotion. That these weapons, these God tools, they will fit every runaway thought, every toxic emotion, and every impulsive action, and it captures them and creates in them and blows the wind of the Holy Spirit so that they become usable. They first have to bring them into a place of submission so that it can be shaped into a life of God where God is being manifested. He doesn't want to annihilate your mind, will, and emotions. He wants a rule over your mind, will, and emotions. And uh, when you, the actual Greek word for that is nous, N-O-U-S. Nous means your mind. We see it in our Bible, mind, but it's often mindset, meaning mind, will, and emotions. If all three are not impacted, you're not going to change any thinking. You won't change thinking with an argument. But we have God tools that bring down arguments and bring them into the spiritual realm of victory. And every loose thought, emotion, and impulse into a structure of a life shaped by Christ. Now, here's the responsible part. This is where you're responsible. We want to see some improvement in your life. Our tools, our tools, who's, who, who's talking there? All of us, not just some leader. Not some gifted person, not Joe Heavy Speaker or Janice he Heavy Speaker, Joe or Janice. It's our tools are ready and at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building a life of obedience to maturity. I love that tra uh, translation. We're using our powerful God tools, and guess what? They're ready and they're at hand. Well, there goes all my excuses on why I couldn't do something right. The tools, I just didn't pick up the tools. Right? Some of you ladies wouldn't look as lovely as you do if you didn't pick up the tools and use them. <laughs> right? Remember Creflo Dollar when he says, before you ever get married, say, I want to see you without makeup before we get married. <laughs> all right? But, uh, <clears throat> yeah, and for the men, if I was a woman, I wouldn't want to marry anybody until I saw them when they got angry. Do you throw things? <laughs> Do you hit people? <laughs> yeah, I'd want to know that kind of thing. All right. But we have these powerful God tools. And what it teaches you to do is that the average Christian can, can learn from willpower, and that's what we're talking about here, how to deal with walls. And um, I'm going to call Connie up here right now because we're going to have a little demonstration of the will. <clears throat> now, let's see. Connie, let's stand, in, in, uh, right, well, stand right over here to my left here. There we go. Connie's a full-stature woman. I, I don't mean height, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, mature, loves God. God's written on the top of her heart, all right? But right here, uh, Proverbs 25, 28 says, Whoever has no rule over their own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Now, what would that look like in her everyday life if she was guilty of that? She's guilty of not living in Proverbs 25, 28, and has the rule of God's not over ruling her spirit. She would be like a city without walls. What do walls around the city do? Protect it, right? They guard it. So that means if I were to say, you're, you're, you're a jerk, Connie, and she had no wall on her heart, it would go right in. Ooh, and she'd go, ooh, that hurt. 
right? Because the only legitimate wall over your will is peace. Let the peace of God rule. If peace is not ruling, flesh is ruling. Flesh does not guard the heart. Self does not protect. It doesn't work. If I were to say something, no matter how much you didn't want to, if your heart didn't have peace in it, it would go right in. Now, where's, where's her spirit? Let's stand over here a little bit more so the camera can see you. those people watching. Put your hands where you're... Okay, that's the epicenter of her spirit. When she invited Jesus to come in, that's where he came in. All right, so now I yell at her, blast her once, and it goes right... Th she put up a, a, a wall when she saw me coming. That or no wall. She wasn't at peace. And I said something ugly and it went right in. Ooh. What does the scripture say in Proverbs 20, 27? The spirit of man, her spirit, that's the doorway. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the innermost rooms of the belly. And belly, bowels, gut, those are the proper translations for the epicenter. The words of a gossip are like tasty morsels. You hear them in, in her ear? Tasty morsels that go down into the innermost parts of the belly. So if you get hurt feelings, where's the hurt at? How did you get the hurt feelings? Someone said something, you heard it here, but it went down into the innermost parts of the belly. All right? And this is where we have to end up teaching people the person who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who can rule his spirit is greater than somebody that takes a city. Okay. So, here's what it would look like. You can kind of face me a little bit here. I'm your boss at work. And you saw me coming and, and say, your thought was, he doesn't look happy. Mm-mm doesn't look happy. First thing you do down here is you protect yourself. Nod your head if you know what I'm talking about. You tense up in the gut. You put up a wall. That's actually your will or the door of your heart. And most of you have done this your whole life and paid absolutely no attention to it. Okay, Connie. And she's going... <laughs> tries to smile because it's the boss. I think you've got one last chance for this job or you're out of here. Uh, ooh, don't tell me that wouldn't affect you because it would if you opened up. All right? So now, Proverbs 16 said, but if she's slow to anger and her heart is guarded, how? what is the only legitimate, if this doesn't work, if this is flesh, this is a carnal weapon. What did we say? The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. So self-protection doesn't work. So what protection does work? Come on, there are only two answers in this church. It's either forgiveness or peace. Peace. The peace of God will guard her heart and her mind. So she sees me coming. Here's what she could do as a Christian if she's going to practice daily walk in the Spirit. And you, practice means, practice makes permanent. This is not easy to learn. This is something that requires by reason of use. She sees them coming and goes, uh-oh, he doesn't look happy. And she had the wall up and she goes, Jesus. She just went from the person who has no rule and like a city broken down, this person has fleshly access to wound her and hurt her. Whereas now, she went, oh, here he comes. He doesn't look happy. Oh, Jesus. What, what did you just do? You went from self-protection to God protection. How do I know if God really protected me? Peace. The peace of God will guard your heart. You're either going to believe the scriptures or you're not. This is not, scriptures are not meant to be poetic. They're meant to be functional, practical, livable. So if she saw me coming 
and went and got the peace of God guarding her heart. And I said, if you do this again, you're out of here. Trust me, you're out of here. Down here, she would, this is like a semi-permeable membrane. You know what I mean by that? I mean stuff can, you can feel it, but not necessarily take it in. So she'd say, and actually, you know what you're doing at that part? If you're letting peace guard your heart, you're actually in the place of spiritual discernment. Because you know what you would feel down here? Peace would guard your heart, but peace would perceive. Remember, this is discernment. Because God's ruling, and peace is guarding her heart and her mind, she would also feel, he's angry. I can feel the anger touching my spirit, but I, it's, you can say, I hear you knocking, but you can't come in. All right? In other words, feeling it doesn't mean you have to own it. I've, we've ministered over the years to so many Christians that own every little offense. As a matter of fact, if you're easily offended, you've got a long ways to go in Christianity. You're offended by this, you're offended by that, you're offended by this. You know what? That was supposed to die as a baby Christian. The blame game. It's always someone else and you're always the victim of an offense. Wrong. You have learned and have the spiritual God tools to defend yourself properly. So she would say, wow, he's angry. He means business, but I'm not taking that in. She will not lose sleep over what that boss said to her. And she will not have to pray through ministry and get ministry. Now, so let's suppose you did take it in. All right, you took it in, and where's the hurt? Down here. My boss said, if I don't, uh, 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 <clears throat> you could be angry, you could be fearful, it could be any of the above. You would drop down and say, no, I accidentally took it in. I received, now receiving in the spirit is like drinking in. I receive, where's the forgiver at? He lives inside, and it is. I know I'm going fast here. It is God who is at work in you to will and to perform. So I'm going to the God in me and I'll say, I receive forgiveness for taking that in from that boss and I release loving forgiveness. She's doing it while I'm talking. I can feel her spirit, aren't you? You have a boss you're forgiving or are you forgiving me for calling <laughs> you up here? Okay. Isn't that neat though? Now when she forgives... If she inadvertently took in junk, remember, the words of a talebearer are like tasty morsels. You get all excited to hear it, but it goes down into the innermost rooms of the belly. It's going to affect you in a negative way. And emotions don't die. They get buried alive. So, are you at peace right now? Okay. You think so. You know so. You... you Everybody knows when they're relaxed or upset. Even unsaved people know if they're relaxed or upset. The goal is that when you're relaxed, God is guarding your heart and your mind. Okay? As long as you're not helping Him by putting up a wall. Okay? All right. Thank you. I'm going to pick on other people. Connie was very willing. All right? So what we're going to be training using your God tools, using the fact that God gave you the equipment, they're ready, they're at hand, they're available, so you're without excuse going, I gotta make a phone call, I gotta call a friend and get ministry on this. There's a place for that, but also you need to learn what to do when you're by yourself, when you're on the job. It's not likely they're gonna let you call for a counseling ministry appointment while you're at work. You're gonna have to learn how to do this in the home. You're gonna have to learn how to do this while you're driving a car. You're gonna have to learn how to do this in school. This is going to be, these tools are ready and at hand and they're available for you. So where, where are they? You walk around with a Holy Spirit toolbox in you. So you're without excuse. You can learn to respond instead of react. When the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing asunder, separating, making a distinction. This is flesh, this is spirit. You have that capacity and you need to act accordingly. Now, Philippians 2.13. Philippians 2.13 shows you that in the area of the will, it is God 
who is at work in you, both to will and to do. Now, does that mean you sit on the sideline and go, all right, God, do it? That's rather uninvolved. No, no, this does not mean that God is at work in you. He's a God. He's making the tools available. He is God. He is Lord of your life, and He's making the tools available for what you need at any given moment in any and all situations. No, no, no exceptions. There's no position in life or the world that these God tools are not at hand and ready to use. What it requires is active participation. So when it says, Philippians 2.13 says, It is God who is at work to will and to perform where, where is he coming from? He's coming from your spirit. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. All right? He's in you. But now, how do you cooperate with him to where God is at work in you, but he's not going to function independently? That's going to require your will to his will. Your will has to match his will. That means the new creation is the one that obeys God. Only the new creation, only from the heart. Head Christians, I, I really feel sorry for you because you've taken some people who are uh, proud of the fact that they're so cerebral. But it, in reality, if that's cerebral, it's going to be maximized. It needs wisdom, not knowledge. Wisdom is the principal thing. Because wisdom is the ability to use that knowledge properly and to make, uh, as Jason's message was, good decisions. Good decisions require discernment. Discernment requires a fear of the Lord or doing everything as unto the Lord. That should be our mindset when you go to work, go to school, and neighborhood, that uh, regardless of the, of the crazy uncles and all the different unusual people you have in your life at work or in the home, you're supposed to be doing and responding to people and circumstances as unto the Lord. You make that shift, and there's a very powerful thing that takes place. You become God-focused, and when you become God-focused, it is self-focused, protecting yourself from wounds and hurts and misunderstandings and victimization, all right? You become God-focused versus self-focused. You become God-protected versus self-protected. What's self-protection look like? Put up the wall. Uh-oh, they're so-and-so. And it doesn't work as it goes right through the flesh. If they say something evil, you get slimed. But if you are God-protected, you're going, oh, there's Ralph coming down here. Oh, I yield to Jesus. That anything Ralph says or does cannot penetrate peace. Peace, it's not poetry. Peace really guards your heart and your mind. Don't you want to be guarded? Aren't there some people in your life that you probably need some peace when they're talking? Come on. Really? Well, you've got a choice now. You can use your God tools and either get slimed and then have to repent and re receive forgiveness and pray for them, or you can resist properly. And the only legitimate wall between you and other people is peace. Let the peace of God guard your heart and your mind. And, if it, and, and unless you're going to call God a liar, don't say it doesn't work, because it does work. It will guard your heart and your mind from anything being planted, mental strongholds and emotional wounding. Peace is militant. Peace is not passive. Peace is not laying down and being walked on. Now, speaking of that, let's explain this. When you yield, it is God who is both willing and doing according to his pleasure. That's the other part that seems to be missed. When you're doing God's will, this is not religious agony. His will is his pleasure, and you can enter into that pleasure when you do his will. <laughs> uh, I think we lose sight of that. We, we built into this religious system to where, well, if it's God, it's got to be make me miserable. You know, no, yeah, you can do that pretty much on your own. 
<laughs> a lot of people think they're in spiritual warfare and it's their own carnality beating them up. Now, there is such a thing as spiritual warfare, but a lot of it's your flesh <laughs> and improper dealing with it. Okay, so now, here's the other one. Uh, I, need, um, uh, I need Dawn to come up here. I want to give an example. And this is the one that the Lord showed me was so important. You stand over here just like Connie. Face me. You scared? Okay, she's thinking of a thing. All right. Here's, here's, here's the choices your flesh have. Uh, and when God opened this up to me, he used a scripture where they went to push Jesus off the brow of a hill, remember? I mean, you know what the scripture said? He walked through the midst of them. All right. Here's the choices your flesh have. All right. Now, in here, you're either going to, oh, man, that person is pushy. Or, push me, I'll push you right back. You can fight, flight, or just, uh, just lay down to be a doormat and let them walk all over you. Right? Those are your unsaved people. That's all you've got. I feel sorry for you. You need Jesus. That's all you've got. All of life is either push, run away, or lay down and let somebody walk all over you. That's not very appealing, is it? That's all you have, and you live your whole life like that. But as a believer, you've got God tools. You don't have to live like that. All right? Here's the one that I saw that Jesus showed me. If you give your will to Jesus, remember, Jesus... They were going to push him off the cliff. He didn't fight back. He didn't run away and he didn't lay down and let him push. But it's a beautiful picture of what he did. He walked right through the midst of them. When there's a fourth choice with the will. Thank you. You can sit down now. You did good. You didn't fight. You didn't flight. And you didn't lay down and faint. Yay! <laughs> Can you see that? There's a fourth choice in the spirit. And the fourth choice in the spirit with the will is that I'm going to do the will of God from the heart regardless of people and circumstances. And then nothing can affect you that God didn't ordain. It just wasn't Jesus' time to be pushed off a cliff. He was going to die on a cross. But the beauty of it was man has no power over a, over a will who's yielded to his will. No man and no circumstance. So you can get out of your pity parties about your poor circumstances because there's absolutely no circumstance or person that can override the will of God in your life if you stay there in the will of God. All things are working together for the good to them that love God and are called according to His purposes. you got to stay in His purposes. Fight, flight, or faint. The fourth option, Luke chapter 4 is that fourth option. He rose up, thrust him out of the city. They led him to the brow of a hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. That's lordship. He submitted to the will of his father, and his father said, nah, it's not your time for these crazies to push you off the cliff. We're going to walk right through it. God's saying, spiritually, it's a beautiful picture of what God wants you to do from the heart. From the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It has to happen here first. It's not all up here. Jesus didn't stand at the door of your head and knock and say, can I come in? He wasn't about to appeal to your intellect. He wanted to appeal to your heart. He wants your heart. Man looks at the outward appearance. God's looking at the heart. And so when you do things unto the Lord, He sees that. And you're really honoring Him. And I'll tell you what, you ravish his heart. Read the Song of Solomon, because it's like, to me, that's the ravishing of the heart that's set toward God, that God sees in that invisible realm, regardless of what the actual circumstances are. Now, <clears throat> that's the fourth option in the will. Now I want to move toward 
the concept of forgiveness, the God tool that forgiveness is available to everybody, and yet I've spent 40-some years watching, and we still get uh, emails and calls from around the world for people who have been trying to forgive. Therein lies the problem. You're trying. Try, T-R-Y. Temporarily resist yielding. <laughs> That's what that means. If you're trying to forgive, you're trying to do it in the flesh. That is not a God tool. A God tool has to be you and God joined together, coming from the heart as a new creation. I've never heard teachings like this. Well, I know, but some of you are really a mess when it comes to forgiveness because you haven't heard this teaching. When in reality, it says, Matthew 18, it's as clear as the nose on your face if you understood it. It says, unless you forgive from the heart. So that means and implies you can forgive from your head and it's not going to work. <laughs> It has to be from the heart. It has to be the new creation you. So like uh, when you forgive, and it can go in three directions, and I want you to look at this. If you are standing at work or something, you don't have to say it out loud. You could, somebody's really messed you up and you hurt your feelings or somebody in the family and you get hurt. You feel the hurt down here. Jesus is the only one that can take your pain and your sorrow. All you can do with your ingenuity and your brilliance, is suppress it and stuff it and live with it, and it doesn't die. Emotions, toxic emotions don't die. They get buried alive. Yep. And you know what? They'll pop up at all the times <laughs> that you wish they didn't. Hmm? Anybody ever had that happen? At all the wrong times in front of all the wrong people. You manifest it. We call that manifest. Okay. And you manifest at various levels. However, manifestation is good. You know what it tells you when you act like that? Jesus isn't ruling right now in your life. All right. So you can take advantage of those manifestations and say, apparently I must need work on this subject. I'll give you a, a tell. Lord, just drop in a word of knowledge in there. There's somebody in here or either watching or in the room. Uh, you have a tendency to say, you always, you never. God says, that's your problem, not theirs. If you're a you always, you never, first of all, it's a lie. But there's a, there's a root issue there. You're hurting somewhere. So if you have a friend, family member, work mate, I know that's a word for somebody, probably more than one. You always, you never, you got, it gets your goat, you've got the goat. All right, we'll move on. <clears throat> so, um, when you yield to the fourth element, you can forgive. But here's the way it needs to go. Watch this. Some of you, I don't know where you get this theology, but you're mad at God. Which I really, I think I understand that. Because He didn't do it your way. Which means, while you were busy being God... God was not running to your beck and call doing it your way. All right? I would release that judgment I made against God. So forgiveness can go toward God, who didn't do anything wrong. It's kind of bad theology to forgive God if you just take it at face value. But to release the judgment you made against Him, that's good theology. I release that judgment I made against God. It's God's kingdom, not mine. <laughs> His rule, not mine. All right, and here's the other one, and this is important because we saw people that were messed up for years as a Christian suddenly turn around and dramatically get better when they received forgiveness. Where's the forgiver live? In you. Now remember, who's doing the forgiving? Only God can forgive sin, but He told the new creation, the born-again people, that you need to forgive, and unless you forgive, I won't forgive you. So to, true forgiveness has to be a believer, if it's going to be Jesus. True forgiveness. Only God can forgive sin, so God's got to be in there. That other kind of forgiveness is basically just putting something on a shelf and trying to forget, which is ridiculous, but that's all they've got. So forgive God flows out. I release that judgment I made against God. 
You can do this while you're at work. By the way, when we taught this to people initially, some people that were having trouble doing it, I remember one lady in particular, she went, she went to the bank and she was upset about some kind of deposit and she went like this. She's standing at the, <laughs> putting her hand here, go, oh. and then he said, is there something wrong with you? Are you sick? Uh, that you go, I didn't want to tell her. No, I'm just trying to get my peace right now. <laughs> I'm just trying to get, I'm just trying to get God here. <laughs> and, uh, and she's releasing. But I thought that was a cute story anyway. But that's real life practicing it in real life at the bank. And God, self is like drinking in. I receive forgiveness. And how do you know if you did it right? Peace. If you forgive God, how did you know if you did it right? Peace. Peace won't lie. Peace is the supernatural exchange that takes place when a spiritual transaction takes place. When you were born again, you made peace with God. Oh, to live your Christian life in offense, you're working more for the devil than for God. Really. Because he's given you the God tools to deal with all offenses and to walk in victory. Offenses mean, some people say, well, you're thin-skinned. Well, no, the problem is you don't have enough God skin because peace would have guarded your heart and your mind. But you've got to use the God tools. They're not just automatic. What's the other one? You release judgment against God. You receive forgiveness, others. When you forgive others, how do you know if you forgive somebody? Say you're looking at them right face to face, just like we use some examples, and you're at work, or you're at school, and they really did you wrong. You can release forgiveness right there on the spot to while they're talking still, you got peace in the gut. That's the transaction of using the God tool that God made available for every believer. Whether you use it or not, though, it's up to you, right? When Jennifer lays her tools out in the bathroom, I don't use them. That's why I don't look as lovely as she does. So if you want to look lovely in the spirit, you got to use the God tools. They are amazing instruments. These women got things. And we every now and then she runs out of something, orders it, and it comes in a package. I open the package and like, what's this thing? Oh, that's a something or something or other that does this, that does that, that does this. Okay. I trust you know what you're talking about. Uh, now, who can forgive but God alone? But yet we must forgive from the heart. So who's doing the forgiving? The new creation, you. It's not you, independent of God, for doing the forgiving. It's you and God co-laboring. All right? Now, here's the other one that I think is important. Um, and this one I repeat often. Uh, I'll, I'll give, give me something so we have a picture up here. Let's have Greg come on up. And uh, all right. uh, Greg already knows this answer, but he's going to play like he doesn't, and I'm going to tell him, okay? All right. When you say, you've heard people say forgive and forget, that's pretty much in the world. Oh, but the scripture says God throws it in the sea of forgetfulness. Okay. But if God throws it in the sea of forgetfulness, he must have forgot that David did all those sins because says, David is a man after my own heart who has done all my will. He forgot. But then, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he put it in the Bible. <laughs> How come it's in the Bible that David committed adultery and, and, and murder? It's failure to understand a very simple process here. Where is the historical record? Point to it there. That's a historical record. It does not get erased here. He does not have amnesia. He's omniscient. And what's it? Why is the, those bad things that happen to you? Why are they up here for your instruction, for reproof, and for correction, so you don't do it again? You learn from it. 
Historical record does not get erased. God does not, what, what sin? If you start acting like that, I know you're lying. Okay. What, what, what sin? I don't remember. God erased it. He, no. Where's the historical record? Where does it get erased? Greg? Where does it get erased? Here. It gets erased here, and that's how come you get peace when you forgive or repent. When it changes to peace, what does that mean? It means that you have the hi historical record here, but the heavenly record has been blotted out, and you've got peace. Peace is the evidence that it's been washed it's been removed. Jesus is the only one that can take your pain and your sorrow. Very good. You answered. You get an A. All right, everybody, even watching, point to the historical record. Okay. That doesn't get erased. Where's the heavenly record? How do you know if it's erased? What's peace? An indication of a supernatural transaction. Just like being born again, a supernatural transaction. See, what we're lacking in the church is not Bible knowledge. We're lacking experience and application. We need to walk in the Spirit, not just talk in the Spirit. Matter of fact, I think God convicts a lot of people, and you need to learn to drive in the Spirit, too. It just didn't have it in the Bible where there were automotives at the time. But if, he was, if there were, he'd say, drive in the Spirit as well as walk in the Spirit. All right. Now, loving functions. I want to cover these loving functions. Um, well, as soon as I say love, I think of Jennifer. Jennifer, you come off. You'll be mine. These are going to be the, uh, the, the six loving functions. And uh, Cliff says there's seven tithing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what he said in one of my classes. I said, there's six loving functions. He goes, seven. And I said, well, what's the seventh one? He goes, tithing. I go, okay, Cliff, way to go. Make you the treasurer. <laughs> All right. Here's Jennifer. And we're going to do the six loving functions. The first one is receiving. Now, I'm preaching and ministering, and Jennifer's receiving. Where are you receiving, Jennifer? There. And where else? Right here. Now this looks funny, but this is really the way you need to learn to listen. Your Christian life needs to have dual awareness. You need to know how what you're hearing is what nature is on it, as well as what information is it scripturally here. That's the way you're supposed to judge prophecy, you know, here and here. Just scriptural isn't good enough. The devil could quote scripture. I want to be able to feel that the devil's on it, right? That distinction. So, it, so, so you don't take it in if the devil's You on don't it. take it in if the, you can hear it. Some people are always afraid of catching something. I'll tell you what, I don't take it in if there feels like, there, if I don't feel the, the love of heaven on it, even a corrective word should have the love of heaven on it. The goodness of God is corrective. The goodness of God overturned the money changers. It was, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, carnally in sin. <laughs> he was sinless. Kindness is gentle. Goodness will be willing to confront and speak the truth and not walk away. The blood is off your hands sometimes when you speak the truth. But if there's anger behind it, you didn't accomplish anything. The wrath of man never works righteousness in the spirit. No. Okay, so receiving here and here. That's the first function. And how did we do this? When I discipled Jennifer and we got married, we would sit with our Bibles open and a notebook to mark down anything that is quickened. We would sit and we would just drink in Drink instead of just think. <laughs> and drink. There, she's doing it right now while I'm standing there. You can feel it. And that feels like our prayer time, at least the beginning. You start by receiving and honoring God. If I don't get a scripture, if I don't hear anything life-changing, I, we, we have received and opened our heart to loving God. Mm, that's special time. 
Now, I'm going to leave my prayer time eventually, and that'll be all the time on what we're teaching today, how to walk in the all of that. But receiving is the first loving function. You've got to learn, or there's no intimacy. How many of you heard preaching and sermons on intimacy with God? That's not a cerebral function. I'm sorry. Intimacy with God is heart to heart. And you have to bear witness to His Spirit that you're a child of God. That bearing witness is actually perceiving in your spirit, not reasoning in your mind. Okay, Jennifer, we're going to do the second one. Loving intercession. How do we do that? Oh, say I'm going to pray for, let's pray for Allison. Let's pray for Allison over there in Virginia. Uh, right now, I would from the belly, as well as my words, make sure that love was flowing toward her. Not, oh, I got to pray that girl straightens out. That's not loving intercession. The motive behind the words toward Allison is I know in my gut right now I'm releasing love. So I know, just like when they tell singers, sing from the diaphragm. Don't they, singers, don't they tell you from down lower than your head? Don't sing from here up. Sing from the, right, from the lower part. Well, I release, we release loving intercession to flow. Right now, I've got peace down here and love is flowing out. Even out of my belly is flowing rivers of living water. But now when I've added words to it, now out of the abundance of the heart, whatever's happening down here, the mouth speaks. That means the, out of the overflow of what's happening down here is attached to my words. Some people are stickler for the words, but they're not a stickler for what's attached to those words. Are you angry at Allison saying, oh, God, please help Allison? Well, if you're angry, you're not accomplished. That's not intercession. Loving intercession is, oh, God, I just release loving intercession to her, and my words have, out of the abundance of my heart, the love motivation behind it, and God's in it, and we're co-laboring. Okay. Third, the third one is forgiving. We already did that one. You receive forgiveness. You release judgment for God. And you release others. When it flows to others, it goes out. When you receive forgiveness, you're drinking in. From Jesus, the forgiver in you. Okay. Releasing. Oh, this is a good one. Give us a, an example, Jennifer, of releasing. Um, Suppose you really want a new car. And that could be very fleshly. Right, right. But um, you just don't have a peace about it. Right. There's a little bit of angst there, a little right. anxiousness. Uh, even the tendency that I could be impulsive right now. Right. <laughs> so you release because you're holding on to what you want, but you release it on a river of release from your belly until you do have peace, and then God could let you know. Yeah, and then it's kind of red light, green light, yellow light. Mm -hmm. but, un but until you're neutral, you don't know. You, you have know. to release to be neutral. You have to be release. Also, you can also, if you're frustrated with a person's lack of behavior or you're frustrated with their behavior, you need to release people. Not just circumstances. I release the demands and expectations on them till I get peace. Because after all, we, when we travel, we used to print cards out with Romans 14.4 and pass out to people because it was, I don't care what church we went to, it was rampant. Control. Junkies. Mothers with their children, everything. Here's Romans 14.4 in the Living Bible. They are God's servants not yours. They belong to Him, not to you. Do you know what that's doing in the Spirit? It's separating ownership from stewardship. As a parent, you might be a steward, but you do not own anybody. They are God's servants, not yours. They belong to Him, not to you. God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong. God's able to make them do as they should. In other words, let it go, release it, and you'll be a lot happier. And sometimes you see results in your prayer life after you release. Right. A lot of times the work God wants to do is for us to give up our idols. And once 
our hearts are right about that, then he can trust us enough to give it to us. Mm -hmm. I thought it was interesting, speaking of Allison, when uh, in the early years that we were married, she was releasing, okay, I'm releasing Allison. And then two minutes later, she's talking about Allison. And then she said, I, I released her. And I said, well, then you're still talking about it. It's still got you going. Well, I really, and I'm saying, Jennifer, show me spiritually what you're actually doing. Because whatever it is, it's not working. She went, okay, I'm going to say out loud what I was doing. I'll release Allison as long as she don't get pregnant. And I'm going, well, there it is right there. That's not a release. You've got strings attached. Mothers, you are good at having strings attached. You let your children go, but if they don't call every day, if they don't, la, 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 la. Yeah, we know how that goes. Fathers, it's the same thing. All right? So that's released. Everybody know how to release something. How do you know if you're released? That's the supernatural transaction. All right. Now, also something about release and why release is so important is because one of the functions of your human spirit, and this is why we teach on the difference between socialism and free enterprise, one of the functions of your human spirit is creativity. You know, under communism, you don't have any freedom. Creativity doesn't flow. There's no need for it because everything's equal outcome. See, free enterprise has equal opportunity, but no guaranteed equal outcome. You could try a business and fail. You could try a business and succeed. There's no guarantee with the outcome. That's part of life. All right? Now, Jennifer is, she released that demand and expectation on uh, getting a car. All right? We'll use that as a thing. She released the demand and expectation, and what happened? Oh, someone just said that that car, there's another car just like it, only a little bit better, and it's on sale right now, and I have a piece about it. Not an impulse. Remember, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Our God tools are to take impulses, emotions, and thoughts that are runaway and bring them into captivity in obedience to Jesus. All right. Oh, I like this one. Next one. The fifth function. Releasing is the fourth function. So it's, if you're taking notes, it's receiving, loving, forgiving, releasing, which includes creativity. Creativity flows when you release a situation. Writer's block. You want creativity to flow? Let it go. If you beat yourself, you're your own worst enemy. You relax. I used to have a keyboard player that was so intent on being perfect that he would perspire while he's playing the keyboard. And I'm going, you never really find the freedom or the enjoyment that's in that instrument as long as you're so zeroed in on perfection that you're perspiring. And then beating yourself afterwards. And then if somebody compliments you, go, oh, no, no, it wasn't me, it was God, it was God. No, it wasn't me, it wasn't God. I said to Steve, you know, you really got to let it go. That kind of life was not meant for anybody, that kind of perfectionism. Now, resisting. Jennifer, how do you do that? How? You stay in peace and don't act on it and don't give in to it. Okay, by def defining the fruit of the okay, Spirit. Okay, let me give an example. Okay. You, yep, yeah, we, we could hear you. Can hear me through the microphone? Yeah. Um, so the first year we were married, we dealt with a lot of fear issues in my life. And um, I just had a lot. Of, I was a fraidy cat growing up. A little much afraid, yeah. I called her. Yeah. And so one night, we were in bed. I was sound asleep. And all of a sudden, I woke up, and I could feel fear in the room and if we feel in here that's our flesh but if we feel something on the outside either attached to it but it's outside of us um, so what I did I felt in the atmosphere and I but I did not give into it I didn't take it in and I, I, I waited a minute and I checked do I feel afraid inside is that in me and I was okay inside 
And so that meant it was in the atmosphere. And by this time, I just said, well, I'm not going to open the door to you. And so I got lost in the spirit, lost in prayer, and yeah, yeah. and it submit in the atmosphere. What she actually did is what you know the scripture says, but most people don't know what to do with the scripture. They quote it. It's not quoting it, it's actually living in it. Submit, submit to, to God. God. Not here. Don't you won't win the battle here. And when you submit to God, submit you will to God, have peace. You'll have peace. Resist and re resist is actually the only legitimate wall is peace. It'll guard your heart and your mind. And when you resist, the enemy will flee because he cannot penetrate the fruit of the Spirit. But no also, demon can penetrate the fruit of the Spirit. Right. You can't touch the fruit of the Spirit. But what I had to learn is that it didn't have to leave in the atmosphere right then. People will say, oh, it's, this isn't working or something, and yeah. they, then they will take it The minute it they in. say this isn't working, you just took it in. So you... You dropped your, you dropped your guard and went into fear. So when you have peace, it's walk in shoes of peace, live in shoes of peace. It's part of your armor. And, and it's why God chose, even in the scriptures, to say, and the God of peace will crush Satan beneath your feet. Isn't that an interesting choice of words? Why did he say the God of peace will crush Satan beneath you? He could have said, the Lord, commander-in-chief of the host of the armies of God will crush the enemy. No, he said the God of peace, because peace is militant. So that's the other thing here. In resisting, it's, it, that's kind of defensive, but on the same token, as you stay there, it becomes offensive. And that brings us to the next fruit of the Spirit, God ruling. And actually, peace, by definition of the fruit of the Spirit, is love resting and love ruling. Ruling is active. Resting is the peace of God can be resting, but as you're resting in Him, you're also ruling and reigning. All right? And then the... the uh, after resisting is ruling and resting. You've entered into the uh, peace that God has, the rest of God, and it's applicable. And these are all God tools. And I only got one page of the two pages I was supposed to cover. I am so bad, but I receive forgiveness. Amen? Thank you. It could be a two-parter. It could be a two-parter. Maybe we'll do the second part. Yes, yeah, it's, it's better to... Give people time to think about it, especially if they're watching. Did the, the visual, did the visual help? Because you've heard all of these scriptures. It's like, I read the Bible. I know what it says. How do I do it? That's, that's the emphasis that needs to be changed in the body. It needs to become livable, applicable, daily discernment, daily living. And what did we end up titling this thing? I... Um, <laughs> I don't know, I changed it 20 times. But how to receive and minister. minister in the Holy Spirit in everyday life, not in a church setting, in everyday life, in your home, in your family. It'll change your life and it'll, it'll speak loud. It's, it's like even, uh, and this is not bragging, but it, was, it impressed me. I have people in the grocery store and uh, Kim's Alteration, which she does sewing, and she said, I like the way you treat your wife. Now, that's a compliment for me, yeah. But it spoke so boldly that I didn't preach to her and say, I'm a Christian, and you need to get saved, and you need to... Do. She saw something. I want that to be so livable that you become a living epistle where your life is read by other people. You won't... Not that I'm against saying stuff and witnessing, but I'm saying, wouldn't it be wonderful to have... Th that really did wonders for me to hear that. Because that was not something I worked up. And it was like something shows God wants to... He wants to be exalted through you to where you're a living epistle, where people will comment on your behavior. And we've had this happen often. When people's lives have changed enough, they will say, where do you go to church? I'm a Christian, but I notice you changed. Because not everybody that goes to church changes. How many know that? 
you know, what's sad um, that we noticed when we traveled a lot is we would teach something like this and go back again, and most of the people had, you know, we'd walk them through forgiveness, they'd experience it and all that, and apparently if your church is not reinforcing this, you have a tendency to go back to the old way you were living. This really does need to be practiced and applied to your life every day to become a permanent part of you. And you were, you were ministering to a lady up in Massachusetts who called and she was just a basket case. She was just um, not doing well at all. And you went back through some of this with her and she said, Oh, oh yeah, I, remember. I remember. I haven't been doing that. So yeah. anyway, I hope she's walking in it more. Yep. Yeah. Amen. Okay, let's stand and have a word of prayer together. And we're going to walk these messages out. We're not just going to talk the talk. We're going to walk the walk. That sounds real. So Father, and Lord, add a blessing to this uh, Morning Star Ministries and everything. They've been really good to us in the time and season that we've been here. So we just bless uh, what they're doing. But uh, from now on, we'll be in our studio every Sunday. Pass the word in case there's someone whose attendance has missed for the last six weeks. Uh, <laughs> they won't know. Um, so, Father, seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.